afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my panelists. Uh, thanks so much, Keith. It was great to have you. I think that uh, we're, we've been talking a lot about consumer-grade design meeting the enterprise, and I think you've, you've just labeled it quite nicely. It's really the humanization of IT. It's not the consumerization of IT. And so um, what I'd love to chat with, with uh, you three kind of industry experts who've been focused on user experience and thinking through what are the implications of design? How do we really make great products? How do we get people excited to use our technology? Uh, is to think about what this means, the impact that it has for all the IT professionals who are here, both on their personal lives as well as their professional lives. And as they're thinking about making decisions in terms of what kind of technology partner do I want? Do I want someone who's really thinking about simplicity and the elegance of design and and what does that take and what should I be looking for? So before we get started, uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about each of you. And I know we could all go out to LinkedIn and check you out and find out more, but this is an intimate group. And I'd love it if you might be able to share something that either led you to be you know, either passionate about user experience uh, and design or something that we couldn't necessarily find out about you if we Googled you. Yep. So. Should we start with Bob? Yeah, thanks for having me here, Julie. It's great to see everybody. This is the largest intimate group I've ever seen. <laughs> um, so my journey really began uh, in Mrs. Reeves' math class when I was a seventh grader in about 1978, when this amazing machine showed up, a Wang computer with a staggering 8K of memory and a cassette drive for storage. And Ms. Reeves spent a little time teaching me how to program in basic, and I was blown away. I just fell in love with computing. To this day, I find computers to be just these magical machines that every time I use them and they work the way I expect, just create a sense of wonder and awe. That got uh, kind of mixed up or married with uh, my experience when I got a Macintosh computer in 1984 when I was in college, and uh, my grade point average went up quite a bit because I was suddenly editing my papers instead of just doing them one time on the typewriter. And uh, that led to a small company. I started doing desktop publishing. And then that was really the thing that introduced me to design, um, graphic design in particular. And that theme of design and computing really came together for me in 1990 when I had a chance to join a company called Claris, which was an Apple subsidiary that moved me to Silicon Valley and really started what, at this point, is a 26-year career in software design. And I still wake up every morning excited to create software and dealing with the challenges of trying to get people and computers to work together a little bit better. I'll start it with Wang. All right. Cliff? Uh, I think that actually um, what got me into design is actually something that we don't even think about that much these days, which is magazines. Hmm. <laughs> um, I remember as a teenager, uh, growing up not around like a tremendous amount of culture or a tremendous amount of like, you know, I didn't grow up in New York or anything like that, but you could go to a magazine and once you opened up that magazine, there was a combination of images, things that somebody had selected, the things that the design decisions that people had made, and it was almost like you're entering a world that was of its own creation, mm -hmm. right? It was a world that was self-contained and it was a world that represented a point of view. And today, I actually still think of doubt design as that. It represents a point of view, it represents actually a set of values that somebody has given, and it actually represents a history that somebody's put into that, that product. And hence how you ended up maybe at Fast Company. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, and Sarah? Yeah, for me, um, I'm on the research side of user experience, and as an undergraduate at UC Berkeley, I was actually studying mechanical engineering originally, um, and I was working on energy efficient technologies as part of an internship at Lawrence Berkeley Labs, and I was tasked with going out and you know, doing all these measurements and calculations about how to build these energy efficient technologies, and what I found was that I really enjoyed the aspect of talking to the people there who were going to be affected by my work much more than all of the calculations and mechanics of it. And, and that set me on a path into user research. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you for sharing a little bit more about each of you. I appreciate that. So um, throughout our, our personal lives and also our work lives, I think uh, there are times where we hit upon a product and we just think, wow, this just does what it's supposed to do. It's so enjoyable. And you know, on the consumer side, it could be your Tesla. I think we have some Tesla drivers out here. Where's Mark Templeton and, and Sue Neal? 
Um, it could be your nest, just making it you know, easy for you to set the temperature in your house. Uh, it could be your Nutanix um, products and Prism, just making your lives easy with, with one click. So what's, you know, could you share maybe an example of you think uh, something that just really demonstrates and sort of resonates the kind of delight that we experience and maybe a little bit of your thoughts in terms of how does that happen or why does that happen? Um, I have an example that I can share. Um, has anybody actually been to Disney World recently? Yes. Anybody in the <laughs> audience? Raise your hand if so. Um, so if you've been there recently, actually, you don't get a ticket anymore. You actually get a band that actually has RFID in it. And there are sensors embedded throughout the park that essentially sense where you are. They sense information about your profile and things like that. So for example, I can make a reservation on my mobile app and just show up at a restaurant, just sit down and actually have food brought to me without telling anybody where I was sitting. I never had to tell anybody what my name was, but you'll still be greeted by name. There's all this kind of profile information embedded in that interaction. And what it means, I think, in the context of enterprise is that there's a way through the technology that we carry with us every day and through knowledge about who our users are to actually make these interactions completely seamless and surprising, right? Mm -hmm. And that speaks to, I think, where things are going, not only in consumer, but in enterprise, like this kind of invisible interaction mm -hmm. of decisions and complexity being offloaded from the user and actually being subsumed underneath a tech layer. I love that. And, and last year, we introduced uh, at this conference in, when we were in Miami, this, um, this theme around invisible infrastructure. So it very much is about making interactions invisible, um, making it so easy to use. You can sort of focus on the higher order bits instead of thinking about, do I have three clicks, four clicks, five clicks? How long does it take me to actually get something done? Anything else that you wanted to share in terms of either something that you think really resonates with ease of use and, and really stands out? And Yeah, I just want to build a little bit on what Cliff said, because I think that you know, the complexity exists. The example that he used is a bewildering array, array of systems and interactions that are coming together. So that it is an enormously complex thing. But Disney, through incredible dedication and teamwork, uh, took all that complexity and they moved it into the machines. And they removed the users away from it. And I think that's really the balance that we're always looking for. The complexity doesn't go away. You know, taking a credit card on the internet is complicated. Managing cloud infrastructure is complicated. The question is, who's going to suck up the complexity? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be the machine or is it going to be the user? Mm -hmm. um, and as we saw in the previous talk, Keith, is that that, that line has now moved. Right? And consumers are understandably expecting, all users are understandably expecting the machines to take up more and more of that complexity. Mm -hmm. So is that kind of the, the, I guess, the end game if you're designing products, like to bring that delightful connection through? Is that really, are you thinking through how easy is it to use? You know, what is the use case? What's the intent? Um, how do we simplify? Uh, or is it all really about getting to that end game around how do I just really delight the end user? But I think one thing is clear is that like you can't necessarily say that there is one simple solution and it's going to please everybody, right? I think the design and in general, uh, anything that presents to the user a very clean experience is a trade-off, right? You have to actually make some organizational decision that we're going to commit to this point of view about the way we want to serve our users as opposed to saying like they have all these features and we need to fill these fill these features like one by one like a checkbox you know mm -hmm. you actually have to come in with that expectation that yeah we're trying to create a point of view that mm -hmm. we are trying to portray in our product as opposed to saying like the user said they wanted a so we'll give them a yeah right? And that's, that's where I think research really comes into the mix of you can't just take what people say that they think that they want. Um, you have to really go in and observe them in their natural work environment and see what they actually do uh, and what's really important. If we just created products that had every single feature anyone could possibly want, and that wouldn't be a delightful user experience. We really need to focus on what's the most useful and efficient things for us to build. That's what we really try to do at Facebook with our business products. Yeah. 
sounds similar. So uh, the way Nutanix looks at our design philosophy, it's what is the intent? What is the end user trying to do? Um, we're a bit opinionated, so we believe in giving choice where choice is warranted, but could we take out some of the complexity by not having to turn all the knobs or turn all the dials, right? And then the end game for us is, you know, if we do both of those things right, how can we uh, delight our customers, which hopefully you see and, and feel as you're managing uh, your, your data center infrastructure. So, um, Bob, we had spoken uh, not too long ago about, you know, do you see companies using uh, user experience and design and, and simplicity and, and really streamline user interfaces as a way to compete in the market? And how, how, do you, how can you tell when a company is actually placing their investment and their strategy there? Yeah, I mean, when I take kind of a long view of technology over, let's say, the last 100, 150 years, we can look at something like the auto industry. So for many years at the beginning, the auto industry competed on technology, right? It was all about horse, uh, horse power, braking speed, uh, safety features like seat belts, windshield wipers, things like that. But after a while, it became more about business models, you know? And you might remember in the 70s and 80s, it all became about financing schemes, price comp competition, things like that. And now what we see is the auto industry, largely thanks to Tesla, they've really moved up, not just to the driving experience that BMW has or the, the kind of the car experience, but really the entire ownership experience. You know, how you, how you buy a Tesla, how you fuel a Tesla, the whole Tesla experience is completely different. And so they've moved up that value chain. And you see it again in, auto, uh, in, auto, in the auto industry, you see it in the technology industry. Um, as you look from consumer space to consumer space, and it's happening in enterprise as well, and certain companies kind of get, they stop at certain levels because the competitive framework doesn't require them to go to the next levels. I, don't, I haven't seen too many companies that go from one, go from competing on technology to competing on business models because they want to. And I can't identify anybody that's gone from competing on business models to design because they want to. It's because the market forces them to. We could take some examples from tech today. I think Google largely competes on technology because they are so far ahead of so many other companies. They're like, that's something that they can really build their company around. Company like Microsoft, Adobe maybe, they're probably still a little bit more at the business model level. Certainly with Adobe, you see it in all the different flavors of Creative Cloud and some of their other offerings. And then a few companies have moved up the value chain to that next level in design, and I think that was you know, a key part of Steve Jobs' competitive strategy with Apple when he came back in 1997. You know, I like to point out that Apple's dedication to design is not some moral decision that design is the better way to live in the world. It's an incredibly productive and profitable competitive strategy to add value uh, and to increase the, the margins on their computers. But Cliff or, and or Sarah, couldn't I just hire a great design team and then, you know, I'm in business. I, I've got a simple, elegant user experience. What does it really take to, I guess, have this investment um, and to really be thinking through that this is the way that you're going to be leading your product into the market? I mean, I think that one thing that's clear about, if you look at companies like this Disney example that we mentioned, if you look at some companies that are actively trying to perform this change in their organization, is that there actually has to be a commitment to having some amount of integration and sort of shared vision across an organization to say, like, OK, you, this person that commands the data in the cash register, are going to meet up with this person who commands the data with park throughput, and you have to sit in a room and figure it out mm -hmm. to create one thing that faces the consumer as opposed to your business silo that you're trying to optimize for, right? So the change becomes, am I going to optimize for this individual business unit, or am I going to actually try to cohere all these things into a single relationship that I'm going to have with my consumer, right? And that, you know, I've been reporting on a uh, major insurance company, right? Enterprise, basically a product that they want to be able to, when you walk into a doctor's office, send you a push notification that just says, this isn't covered, here's why you might think about your in health insurance and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. It's obvious because that's what we expect out of technology today, mm -hmm. but it's non-obvious when you say, like, this guy's never been in a room with this guy, yeah. they've never been forced to work together, all those things don't happen, right? So there has to be that mandate and that willingness at an organizational level to say, we're going to stick all these things together. Yeah. 
And something else I think is important is when you have a diverse group of different job functions and people working towards the shared goal is that you have to bring everyone along for the ride. So I think building empathy among all the different team members, you know, the engineers who are writing the code might not have ever been in the job function of the people who will ultimately be using that software. So whether it's through research or, you know, visits in the field or whatever, you really need to build empathy among the team to help them understand who they're designing and building for. Mm -hmm. And maybe thinking about the experience broadly, right? About how do you start to understand the intent, maybe automate certain functions, think, thinking back to invisible interactions, and then truly making that invisible. Yeah, it's also, I think you have to really change the incentives for the company. You know, the companies that I've been part of were designed as a competitive advantage. The entire incentive structure of the company is around producing the greatest consumer experience possible. Like that's all anybody talks about at every level of the company. Mm -hmm. The operations people, the QA mm -hmm. people, like everybody all through the company, all they're thinking about is are we delivering the greatest experience possible? And there's a, a belief that uh, we'll make money as a consequence. Uh, but we're, the, the company doesn't wake up every day thinking about how to make money. And they don't wake up every day thinking about how to deliver the best, the uh, huge set of features. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw it at Apple, like, Throughout the ops people, there's just stories after stories I could share when we have more time um, <laughs> of just the dedication at the individual level because the incentives were around producing the best possible mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think actually something between what Sarah said and what Bob said is that, you know, Sarah, you're talking about research. Bob, you're talking about maximizing for the person first. There's a tremendous amount of humility that comes in that, right? The, I think the importance of research is that, like, you are not the user. Right? And you can't just make assumptions about what that's like. You actually have to have humility in the face of that and say, okay, I'm going to listen. I'm going to actually see if this works mm -hmm. and not assume that I know what's best just because I know how this thing works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I know we just have a, a couple of minutes as I keep track of the time over there. So uh, just coming back to what Keith was saying around the, the humanization of IT and humans aren't going away. So we've seen a lot of fads in IT. We've seen things come and go. It's taken a long time, I think, uh, in, in this particular industry to get to a point where people are realizing that it's actually OK to not have complicated uh, interfaces and it's okay to and, and very well you know very much wanted to remove the complexity so is this focus on simplicity and um, and the user experience a fad do you think in uh, in enterprise IT is it something we'll still be talking about next year oh it's definitely not a fad um, I think it's here to stay for a lot of reasons you know one of which is that uh, an in, if you think of your users as individual humans, they wake up every morning, and almost from the second they wake up, they're dealing with technology. You know, all of you had and a lot of interesting touch panels probably in your hotel rooms that you had to figure out, right? There's, there's the UI on your washing machine on <laughs> the your drapes. dishwasher. The drapes. The drapes alone were confusing. You know, the dashboard in your car, like, like you're interacting with software and technology all the time. And so any given product that you're interacting with has to get increasingly simple, if you will, to, re to, uh, to require less and less of you cognitively. So even though any given tool might be getting simpler, any individual user's experience overall is actually getting you know, exponentially more complicated. Yeah, I mean, just to build on what Bob's saying is I, I think that we've crossed a threshold that we can't come back from, which is for many, many years, for 30 years in the history of computing, it was okay to put something in a submenu on a desktop computer, right? Mm -hmm. Right now you have mobile, which actually forced the simplification and clarification of what something needed to be, what a user needed to do in that. And now if you think about 15 years beyond that, these devices are going to explode into our environment mm -hmm. into a, in a way that actually is going to have even less interface than a glass screen, right? And that demands that somebody have a very clear point of view about what I'm going to provide you, when I'm going to provide it for you, and actually who you are, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this simplicity is not a fad. I think, you know, if you think about when is, ever, when is a user ever going to say, please make things more complex for me, uh, make it more difficult for me to find what I want to do efficiently. Um, and I think, honestly, is for business and enterprise software, it's even more important than for the consumer experience. I know I feel an obligation to the businesses who use Facebook software um, to, to make it efficient as possible for them when people are in your tools 40 hours or more a week. Um, so that I even think about, you know, if I can 
help make the design and the user experience even more clean, then that person can get home to their family you know, a couple minutes earlier on Friday afternoon or go out and meet their friends. Yeah. So I think it's incredibly important here to stay. Yeah, giving, giving people their weekends back and an opportunity to focus that time on things that they either want to do or just that are higher value for them. So thank you so much for um, coming and sharing your opinions and your background and your experience uh, in this area. And uh, I hope you en enjoy the rest of the conference and we'll look to see you maybe another time. Thanks thank for you. Having me. Hey, thank you. All right. Thanks, guys.